بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم اٹس ونڈرفل سینگ یو ونس اگین ود لیکچر ٹوینٹی ٹو آف ماڈرن ناول دیٹ از ناول ٹو ویل دی انٹرسٹنگ تھنگ اباؤٹ ٹو ڈیز لیکچر از دیٹ وی آر گوئنگ ٹو اسٹارٹ ود اے نیو رائٹر اینڈ اے نیو ٹیکسٹ ایز اے میٹر آف فیکٹ وی آر گوئنگ ٹو اسٹڈی ای ایم فوسٹر اینڈ فار دیٹ میٹر وی آر گوئنگ ٹو اسٹڈی ای ایم فوسٹرز ماسٹر پیس اے پیسج ٹو انڈیا سو ٹو ڈیز لیکچر از گوئنگ ٹو بی آل ٹوگیدر اے نیو a new episode of a new series and that is going to last seven to eight lectures where we will be covering this um, new text in our course a passage to India um, today's talk is going to include um, a preface on the on the writing we will have a word about E.M. Foster and we will have a look at the text that he has written and then we will try to cover up the summary of the narrative Let's start with today's talk and see what do we have to discuss. Well, regarding um, the text, A Passage to India, it's a novel written by E.M. Foster um, that was uh, first published in 1924. E.M. Um, Foster is an English author and he sets against, uh, he sets against this novel the, the backdrop drop of the British Raj and the Indian independence movement in the 1920s. So it's not only that we are covering 20th century where we are mostly relying on um, and mostly covering the English uh, uh, traditions and English society. We, are, we have covered this, uh, in this, in, in this novel we are going to cover a writing that has been written in the background of English Raj. It was selected as one of the hundred great works of English literature by the Modern Library and won the 1924 James Tate Black Memorial Prize as well for fiction, uh, of course. Time magazine, a famous uh, publication, included the novel in its hundred best English language novels from 1923 to 2005 and that's a big award, big acknowledgement. The novel is based on Foster's experiences in India. So more or less you will find you'll have a flavor of autobiographical art autobiography uh, in the novel and you will you will just you know uh, find it very interesting to read through. E.M. Foster borrowed the book's title from Walt Whiteman, poem of the same name in Leaves of Grass. So the name of the of the novel is in fact borrowed by uh, Walt Whiteman. Now, if you look at the story, it revolves around four main characters: Doctor Aziz, his British friend Mr. Mr. Carl Fielding, Mrs. Moore, and Miss Adela Quested. During the trip to the to the Marabur Caves, modeled on the Barabur Cave Caves of Bihar, Adela accuses Aziz of attempting to assault her. Aziz's trial and its run-up and aftermath bring out all the racial tensions and prejudices between indigenous Indians and the British colonists who rule India. So I'm sure it's going to be a pretty interesting read for us. However, before we get into the, uh, into the depths of the narrative, we would like to go through the writer and would, would try to know as much as we can because we understand and we are very careful about it that knowing the writer is very important in order to understand and know his or her writings. Well, it's a pictorial outline of, of E.M. Um, e. Foster starting from his early or maybe just about teens and finishing up at his um, I would say quite a mature 40s of uh, 40 in age um, uh, and you can see that different captures during different times of his life. Um, Ian Foster, he born in 1879 in London, son of an architect and um, Marine Toronton leaving Foster 8,000 pounds enough for him to live on and enabled him to become a writer. Um, he has f uh, finished, he had finished his uh, college from King's College, Cambridge from uh, starting from 1897 and finished it in 1901. 
and he's one of the one of the uh, I would say glowing star of uh, Bloomsbury uh, Bury Group as well. And we have this history of Bloomsbury Group that we have been discussing in almost all of our major uh, discussions. Speci specifically referring to those where we discuss the writers and in the in the atmosphere of skepticism he became under the influence of Sir Jamer Fraser Nathaniel Wedd and Goldsworthy Lois Dickinson and G. E. Moore and shed his not very deep Christian faith well um, he has he's a good well-traveled person who traveled Italy and Greece with his mother, Egypt, Germany, and India with the with the classicist Goldsworthy Lewis Dickinson in 1940. Um, Muhammad Al-Adil, 1916 to 17 in Alexandria, Egypt. Good night, my lad. For not eternal, no league of ours for sure. Um, these are the novels which are written in his love and Kenya 1920s in India first ongoing sexual relationship of his life so his life has been pretty much uh, uh, a kind of uh, a kind of uh, conflicting uh, thing for people and pretty much a pretty much a hidden kind of um, story for people where they wanted to know about what is his about what is about his personal life and how he has been into these love affairs and known for them as well uh, however, after the age of 45, um, he stopped writing novels and produced little more fiction apart from short stories only for himself in a small circle of friends. Um, and he was a successful BBC broadcaster in 1930s and 1940s. And, he, he, uh, and as well as he received honorary fellowship at King's College, Cambridge. And, and finally, he died in Con Con Coventry at the age of 91 in 1970. This was a short and very brief outline, uh, historical outline of uh, E.M. Foster. However, if you would want to know a little more about it, you will have to go through the details of that. Um, now, what are the key themes in E.M. Foster's novel? Um, if we just, you know, uh, go through very quickly all of his writings and get the essence together, we will get to know that the pursuit of personal connections, in spite of the restrictions of contemporary society, is one of the major themes that he would present in almost all of his writings. And then you will find the irreconcilability of class difference is one thing that would pinch him hard whenever he would start writing a, or designing a plot. So you will also find the reflection of irreconcilability of class difference in his writings too. Sexuality um, and a general shift from heterosexual love to homosexual love over the course of his writing career is also a point of attention. Uh, the posthumously published novel Murky and the short story collection The Life to Come is um, both are basically good examples of this shift in his writing. Um, and this slide will give you information about the um, novels that he had written. And um, this is basically about the Howard's End. And the story deals with, this was directed by James Ivory in 1992. And um, Emma Thompson won the best award on that. So the point to show you about this, uh, you know, these claims regarding his works is that most of his works have been filmed later on because they would very much portray the society uh, uh, and a visual representation of his novel were quite a, was, was quite a pleasure for viewers as well as producers. And uh, another of his uh, interesting um, novel that later on filmed by producer was Murky. Um, it's, a, it's a story of homosexual love and, and um, it's quite an interesting plot that would you, you may would, write to, would like to read later on in order to understand more about the style that E.M. Foster used in his writings. And then um, comes a passage to India, uh, one of his master pieces, and that is again a novel, however, later on filmed by um, 
uh, directors and uh, was a kind of interesting watch and one wonderful thing is that I'm trying hard to get my hands on the movie and as soon as soon I get it I'm going to incorporate um, the scenes of that for your um, uh, you know comprehension or better comprehension well this was about uh, some glimpses of his of his uh, uh, novels which were later on filmed by producers as well now let's let's have our move to um, the work the text that we are going to include in our in our course for the semester um, by E.M. Forster that is a passage to India let's start our discussion on that so a passage to India was first published in published in 1924 and the last completed novel that Forster published during his lifetime. We just mentioned that we just could discuss that although he kept writing after writing this novel but those were not um, complete narratives or short stories they, those were some other types of writing that he then did not uh, fo forward them to for publication those were written just for himself and then f for a very close circle that he kept at that time. Um, in this novel, the major characters uh, which are involved are Dr. Aziz, Fielding, Adela Quested, Mrs. Mu, Professor um, Narayan, Godbole, and Roni Hillslop. So, um, A Passage to India that is um, directed by David Lean in 1984, and uh, you're going to watch the glimpses of the movie as well keeps several themes and most of them you will find present in almost all of the writings by E.M. Foster. Um, the major themes involve the difficulty of friendship between an Englishman, the colonist and an Indian, the colonized. So it's a kind of relationship that E.M. Foster would like to bring forward that shows us the nature of the kind of relationship that a colonizer keeps with the colonized. The racism and oppression of the British who rule India and the muddle of Indian civilization and psychology and the oneness and perhaps sameness of all life. Um, the novel was Foster's most famous and popular novel A Room with a View was published in 1908 and, and the background it covers is the British Empire zined. The, the Brits enjoyed the fruits of a system of exploitation and oppression. And um, as far as its, its, its fatal background is concerned, you will find that part one of the novel and the last chapter, Florence, is, is, is basically filmed in Florence, Italy, and part two basically covers the survey of England. Um, if we get, go a little deep into the novel Our Room with a View, just to understand and bring two or three of his writing into comparison to see what kind of references uh, exist there, you will find that the novel covers cultural and social background, where it, it throws light on the remnants of Victorian sensibilities, maybe it, its refine, refinement, the virtue of young girls, the control of passions and also time of change when women begin to to clamor more loudly than ever for equal rights and he also discusses socialist world challenging old ideas about class and religion and throws light on how artists and thinkers begin to challenge Victorian attitudes about emotion and sexuality so in a nutshell if we bring forward the major themes they would include property and passion, uh, propriety and passion, the beauty of human beings, travel and the idea of Italy, the beautiful and the delicate women's position and independence and connection between nature and man. Um, it, moreover, some of the sub-themes would include uh, passion and the body, the medieval, the renaissance and the classical times, music, the muddle and class snobbery. Well, um, a Room with a View and A Passage to India both are both are very interesting novel novels and why they are point of our attention is that they both keep the kind of the same kind of popularity. So if you really would want to know a little more about the writer and his writing style, I will advise you to go through some of his writings and um, and primarily for that matter you can uh, go through a room with a view as well. 
So going through these the themes which are present in a room with a view and then coming back to the themes that we could pinpoint um, looking at the, the common understanding based on the novel, we can see that E.M. Foster is a kind of writer who would like to take challenging aspects to write about. For example, touching about, uh, you know, thinking and focusing on the topics such as racism and oppression and colonize, colonies and colonizers is not an easy, easy task. Specifically, when th this, this, this courage has been taken into the, into the in the 20th century, the time of chaos and time of tension. So my idea of giving you a view uh, was to look at the look at the look at the canvas uh, and the and the and the type of colors that the writer is dealing with. The canvas is the time and era when the writer is writing, and and also the society which is reflecting on his writings. And the colors, the, the passions, the emotions, the courage, and the guts that the writer use, use in order to um, convey his message into one very interesting um, story and outline. So let us start with our, with our detailed talk on a passage to India by looking at how we are able to understand it. E.M. Foster wrote, and I mentioned it that the, 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 the novel was first published in um, 1924 and the last completed novel it was um, before uh, his death. Uh, the novel differs from Foster's other major works in its, in its overt political content as opposed to the lighter tone and more subdued political subtext um, contained in works such as Harvard Zend and A Room with a View. Um, the, the, the novel's story make, makes us feel that the tone is very lighter, uh, although it touches upon all those um, ideas that are, that are, or that will be present um, as major or subcategories in the rest of his writings, however, in this novel you will find that he presents things very smoothly and with a subtle sense of um, story that he presents. The novel deals with the political occupation of India by the British, a, colon a colonial domination that ended after the publication of Foster's text and still during his lifetime. Um, Foster took the title from Walt Whitman's poem, Passage to India, that was published in 1870. The Seuss Canal creating a passage to India was completed in 1869. While Passage to India is very much about the anticipatory joy of a global union fulfilling the destiny first sought by Christopher Columbus, it is also about the voyage of the, of the soul or spirit and the resultant discovery that lies beyond India, the cradle of civilization, the motherland of America. In fact, it is India as the ultimate goal of Columbus' voyage that represents all great human undertaking and at the same time the distinct wonder of America. For when Columbus arrived in America, he thought he was in India from an analysis of Asian influences in Passage to India by Matthew Whiteman Lezenby. Well, um, now, a word about the background of the novel. We know that the novel has a political background. The colonial occupation of India is significant in terms of the background of the novel. Britain occupied an important place in political affairs in India since 1760, but did not secure control over India for nearly a century. In August of 1858, however, during a period of violent revolt against Britain by the Indians, the British Parliament passed the Government of India Act, transferring political power from the East India Company to the Crown. That was a big uh, move in the history. Um, this established the bureau bureaucratic colonial system in India headed by a Council of India consisting initially of 15 Britons.
All the Parliament and Queen Victoria mentioned support for local princes. Victoria added the title Empress of India to her regality. Well, the typical attitude of Britons in India was that they were undertaking the white man's burden, as put by um, Rodyard Kipling. This was a this was a system of aloof, um, condescending sovereignty in which the English bureaucracy did not associate with the with the persons they ruled, and finds its its expression in characters such as Ronnie Hillslope and Mrs. Uh, Mr. McBride in a passage to India. When you will learn about the story, you will able to understand this point very clearly. And then we see Indian nationalism begin to um, ferment around 1885 with, with the first meeting of the Indian National Congress. And nationalism found expression in the Muslim community as well as around the beginning of the um, 20th century. So the reforms in India political system occurred with the victory of the Liberal Party in 1906. Um, culminating in the Indian Council, Council's Act of 1909, but nationalism continued to rise. And now you'll be able to develop the links that this was the time when E.M. Foster was doing his college, the time when you are most, most sensitive, uh, in your most sensitive age, and when you really uh, have those emotions and passions to uh, look at the things, absorb them in their true capacity, and you know, you can develop your, your point of views on them. Well, um, India took part in the First World War and assisting the British with the assumption that this help would lead to political concessions but even with the promise after the war that Indians would play an increased role in their own government, relations between the English and Indians did not improve at all. So what happened that after the war tension continued, in 1919, 10,000 unarmed Indians were massacred at Amritsar's Jiranwala Bagh during a protest, which was a, which was a very sad incident. It is around this time that uh, Mahendis Karmachand Gandhi became a preeminent force in Indian politics, and it is also around this time that Foster Wood wrote a passage to India. So I hope that now things are getting clear in your head. Um, more than 20 years later, after a long struggle, Parliament passed the Indian Independence Act in 1947, ordering the separation of India and Pakistan and granting both nations their sovereignty. Well, after this, uh, this little bit of background, we are, we are at a point where we can, we can get understanding about the plot. We are introduced to Chandrapura, a city that is part of the British Raj in the story. And it is separated into three parts, mosque, caves, and temples. And these three distinctions and then symbols are playing a very significant role in the, in the narrative. Um, Aziz is a poor doctor. If we discuss the, the concept of mask or the symbol of mask, we see that um, uh, Aziz is one who belongs to this symbol and he is a doctor who has lived dutifully under British command but has grown more frustrated with their treatment of him and his fellow Indians. Now, in the plot, we get to know that Aziz and his friends discuss the English and complain that they, are, they have changed in their attitude over the years and have become more intolerant and cold because of the circumstances around. The British officials of, at, the, at the civil station in Chandapur run a club that, f that forbids Indians from attending and try to avoid any kind of intimate relationships or bonds or friendships with the natives. And then we get to know that Mrs. Moore and Adela Quested, who come over from England to visit Ronnie Hellslop, where Mrs. Lu Mrs. Moore's, um, where Hellslop is Mrs. Moore's son and Adela's fiance. Um, 
The second important symbol is of caves or second important distinction is of caves. Now, caves are very symbolic in this narrative and what is the background of these caves is that Aziz gets to the train station especially early so nothing will go wrong with the excursion. Mrs. Moore and Adela arrive on time but Fielding and Godbole have not yet arrived. Aziz is nervous because he does not want to be left alone with the women anticipating that trouble will arise. So the tension was already in the air. Roni also dis 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 disapproves of the women being left alone. He sends over a servant to follow them to make sure they are not left alone with Dr. Aziz. Fielding and Godbole arrive too late. They miss the train and Aziz is left to travel alone with Mrs. Moore and Adela. They put him at ease and assure him that they are in good hands. At the caves, the weather is quite hot. So all of all of these all of these three um, Aziz and the two women they go in out uh, in and out of the caves, which all look similar. Within the caves is the haunting sound of an echo. While Mrs. Moore is in the cave, which is completely dark, she feels something touch her. But she is haunted by the sound of the echo, which takes over her thoughts. She decides to rest after her experience and let Adela and Aziz continue to explore other caves. Adela becomes preoccupied with her engagement to Ronnie and realizes she does not love him anymore. Or maybe she never loved him. Before she enters the cave, she asks Aziz about his wife and love. Adela and Aziz become separated eventually and Aziz cannot find Adela. Aziz hears a car and later assumes that Miss Dirk, Adela's friend, picked up Adela. Fielding joins Aziz and Mrs. Moore and they board the train back to Chandapur. When the train pulls into the station, Aziz is arrested for charges that are unknown to him. Fielding publicly vows to defend Aziz and alienates himself from his countrymen. Aziz is charged with making improper advances to Adela in the caves. Fielding believes that Adela was hallucinating. As the trial approaches, Mrs. Moore becomes more aloof. Adela seeks her support, but Mrs. Moore wants nothing to do with her or anyone else. Adela is haunted with the echoes from the caves and when she realizes Aziz's innocence, the echoes go away. She tells Ronnie about her doubts of Aziz's guilt and Mrs. Moore backs them up, but Ronnie encourages her to go on with the trial and continue to press charges. Mrs. Moore, with the support and encouragement of her son, leaves for Britain before the trial. She dies en route, unable to endure the heat and travel conditions. At the trial, Adela continues to hear echoes. So the courtroom becomes charged with emotions. Indians in the, uh, in the, in the, in the quarters begin to call for Mrs. Moore to clear the name of Aziz. The, this, this, in the courthouse, the situation is very complicated now. When Adela is called to the witness box, Mr. Magbert presses her until finally she admits that she is not sure if Aziz is really guilty. The judge drops the charges and all of the Indians in Chandapur celebrate Aziz's victory and clearance from the charge. Adela walks the streets in a daze and is, is intercepted by Fielding. He invites her to his office for her safety. Aziz becomes jealous while Adela and Fielding spend time together. Fielding pities her since her engagement has been broken and since she put her life on the line to tell the truth. He asks Aziz not to collect money from Adela for damages. Rumors begin to spread that, the, that he and Adela are having an affair. Fielding denies the rumor, but in the back of his mind, Aziz believes the rumor to be true and thinks Fielding will marry Adela for her money. After the trial, Aziz wants nothing to do with British and begins to write uh, poetry about the motherland and the nation. 
he decides to move out of the Raj to a free Indian state. Fielding and Adela return to England. And this was the major part of the plot, the storyline that you will find very interesting then we will be linking up with the with the tiny pieces into the plot to understand the complete structure that the E.M. Foster has created for you. Now the third important and very significant symbol um, I would say a part of the plot that will come up is temple, the presence of temple. Two years have passed and Aziz and Godbole now live in Mayu and an independent Hindu state. Godbole is the Minister of Education and Aziz has a clinic in town. The town is celebrating the arrival of a new god and is filled with singing and dancing in the streets. Godbole receives a note that Fiedling and his new wife will be paying a visit. He tells Aziz who refuses to see them. Aziz has ignored all of Fielding's letter and postcards over the years and assumed that he has married Adela in London. Aziz runs into Fielding and his new brother-in-law Ralph by accident when he goes out to attend to Ralph's bee sting. Aziz treating Fielding coldly. Fielding asks why Aziz never returned his letters. And finally Aziz realizes that Fielding did not marry Adela, but Mrs. Moore's daughter, Stella. Adela introduced them in London. Aziz continues to behave coldly and says he wants nothing to do with the British. Later on, Aziz checks up on Ralph's bee sting and continues to be cold, but is finally overcome by a spiritual epiphany brought on by the celebrations in the town. He asks Ralph if, if he knows when a stranger becomes a friend and he answers yes. This was what his mother said to Aziz in the mosque when they met. Finally Aziz and Fielding become friends again. Aziz gives Fielding a letter to deliver to Adela for giving her for her charges against him. He has left the past behind him. As Fielding and Aziz say their final goodbyes, their horses pull them away from each other and they know they will never see each other again. One night what happens that Mrs. Moore encounters Dr. Aziz in a mosque in the moonlight. They are at first startled by each other but instantly become friends. Mrs. Moore and Adela are more liberal than Ronnie and wish to see the real India and be friends uh, of Indians. Mr. Fielding, the principal of the government college, invests Adela and Mrs. Moore to his home for tea. He also invites Dr. Aziz, who he recently met and liked instantly, and his mystical Hindu uh, colleague, Professor Godbole. And Fielding's tea party is very friendly and comfortable. Aziz feels so at ease that he invites the women on an excursion to the caves at Marabar. So this was the background of their journey, although it comes later on that we, need, we get to know it. That what happens and how they all got together and how they set their journey to the caves to understand India a bit more. Now, so far I have given you the highlights of the story to make you understand, to make you curious, so you want to know what happens in the beginning, what happens in the end. And I have given you the middle part to keep your curiosity um, ongoing. So now I want you to please go through and do your reading and complete your reading before we, we reach the next uh, lecture. So by then you are done with your reading and you are able to discuss um, um, better and you are able to follow me uh, and comprehend. And the discussion. So the story starts with uh, where uh, Mr. Aziz uh, meets the, 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 the people from England and then um, by the end of the meeting what happens that they decide to set on a journey and that is basically to know India a bit more, the journey to the cave, exclusion to the caves. So let's start with our brief discussion on the plot and see how the events take place by giving them some, some titles and see how we are able to understand. In chapter 1 what happens that we are seeing that Marabur hills are described as the fist and fingers of the south. 
Now, fist and finger is like this uh, image, and if you if you if you view the Marlborough Hills, you will get to know that why this imagery is used here. Despite their human characteristics, the hills are imposing. Earth here is more impressive than any of the people in Chandrapura. In Chandrapur, rather. Um, then a move on, a move later in chapter 3, you will find that the women are fascinated by the moonlight, which has a mystical quality to it. However, a British stranger reminds them that in British India, though they might be halfway around the world from home, they stick to the same moon. It's not new. There is nothing new. Therefore, there is a little spirit or imagination in the India of the English. Mrs. Moore and Adela hope for something more, something new. What happens that looking into the sky, Mrs. Moore sees a moon that is very different from the moon in England. Why so? This moonlight filled her with a sense of unity with nature and the heavens the way it never had at home. And then in chapter 10 we find that the heat of April and an aspect of the earth in India makes things quite unbearable and influences the behavior of those who live in there. And, and you will find that all these points are being categorized as points, topic tracking, and the topic headline is Earth. So I would want you to find out relation between the topic and the evidences and supporting ideas that are being provided. And if you find any, any conflict in between them, you are to sort it out with substantiating it and by giving your reasons. A few more ideas that will help you understand the category and its, its subcategories. The idea of the McBride tries to argue that the hot climate and geographic conditions of India drive the Indians to behave the way they do. So um, a relationship is set between the, the land and the people who live there. He contends that, that nature has control over man in India and if the British were to endure this climate, they would behave the same way. So there's nothing cool in being British. It's a relationship between land and the people who live in there and to develop their attitudes accordingly. Then in chapter 23, you will find another evidence which would, which would come into this category of earth. That is, when Mr. Moore first come, came to India, the mystical forces of the earth overtook her. However, after the engagement of Roni and Adela, she becomes burdened with the duties of reality and this disrupts her union with spirit and art. And a few more supporting ideas regarding art is when the echoes of the cave haunt Adela and make her question her charges against Aziz. The sound of the caves haunts her until she reveals the truth about Aziz and clears her conscious. And then you finally will find in chapter 37, the earth prevents Aziz and feeling from riding back to each other. It prevents the con con continuation of their friendship at, at least until the British leave India. So, why am I giving you, I might have added this information into when, when I'll be discussing themes based on the novel, however, um, why I'm bringing them in the very beginning is that when you are reading your text now, you are using different ideas and before you start your detailed reading, you make certain groups of ideas and then keep putting your ideas down under those categories so you have your own data complete for your discussions by the end of reading novel. In the previous text, we also had a little change of methodology where I tried to give you an idea of uh, not only doing everything. In the very first place, what we did, we did everything separately. We discussed themes separately, we discussed chapters separately, we discussed characters separately. And by the end, I, I tried to give you some consensus and we, we put 
all this information together to have our few uh, discussions at the end. However, in the previous uh, uh, novel, I gave you a bit different methodology that I tried to take three things together where I'm discussing the the characters along with the themes that they support the symbols the motives and the allegorical nature of the novel so taking three or four things things together by linking them up to basically achieve the thematic goal that we want to now in this uh, novel what I am changing a bit more is that in the very beginning I'm giving you the big ideas being discussed in the story the major themes and the major categories of uh, ideas which are explored so right from the beginning you can make your own categories and when you are reading the novel when you are doing your reading put down the ideas under those categories so by the end when you have your uh, uh, discussions in uh, on hand you have enough data ample data to support and substantiate your views on that now um, another category that would emerge out of your reading you will you will find is is of love in chapter 8 um, it says it is presented that though they have broken off the engagement and this will refer to Adela and her engagement the bumpy ride in Nawab Bahadur's car awakens Adela and Roni's feeling of love or at least lust. In chapter 11 you will find Aziz and Fielding discuss marriage. Aziz admits that he fell in love with his wife after they were married. Sharing the photo of his wife with him is an act of brotherly love. Fielding also admits that he has never married or never plans to. He says he is too old to fall in love. Then another, some other supporting details for this category of of theme is that Adela begins to doubt her love for Ronnie. She realizes she is not in love with him and questions if she is capable of loving another. She thinks she is too intellectual to be in love. Then you will find in chapter 27 that Fielding cannot understand why Aziz loved Mrs. Moore so much since she had not been there for Aziz especially after the cave incident. He tells Fielding that Mrs. Moore was oriental in her emotions. She never measured love. Fielding is very western and Aziz feels he measures his emotion quite too much. In chapter 28 you will find Ronnie terminates the engagement with Adela. The, the two had never been in love and were probably incapable of loving each other. And then in chapter 29, both Adela and Fielding have given up on love and think they will never love any, anyone. And in chapter 36, you will find Ralph telling Aziz that his mother loved him very much. Though Aziz is very short and Ralph, Ralph overlooks the behavior and assures him that he is a friend. Though he is a stranger, this oriental attitude is like his mother's. Ralph proves he is capable of loving on instinct the way his mother had. So these were the bits on love and now we are exploring the category of nationalism, the patriotism that is, that is shown through different evidences in the story. In chapter 3, you will find that the British national anthem inspires feelings of power rather than patriotism. England's role in India is one of power and control, is not of love. In chapter 14, however, you will see that while discussing Akbar, a Hindu figure who had a unifying force, Aziz tells Mrs. Moore and Adela that India cannot be united. As a Muslim, he feels divided from the other half of India. And then in chapter 24, Adela begins to feel guilty about the notion of the British as a civilization force. She contemplates who gave them the right to control a country at the same time. Meg Brights uses a scientific approach to prove the racial and national superiority of the British over the Indians. 
Muhammad Ali becomes vocal about the unfair role of the British in India. He stands up for Indian nationalism and storms out of the code. And finally you will see in chapter 25 that the otherwise pro-British Nawab Bahadur, the most diplomatic and respected of Indians, becomes so inspired by the cruel treatment of his son and the treatment of Aziz by the British that he re renounces his name and title for his Islamic name. Chapter 30, the trial awake, awoke the nationalist spirit in Aziz and he now began to think of the motherland in his poetry. And then you will find that Aziz finally expresses his wish not to associate with any British people anymore and he even pushes away the friendship of feeling for that matter. And in chapter 37, Aziz and Fielding part ways knowing they can never be friends as long as the British continue to control India. And now a bit about religion. You will also find religion having its roots in, in the story very deep because um, the cave and mosque are basically the symbols of religion, the religious belief that uh, Ian Foster explores in the story. In chapter 2 you will see that at the mosque Aziz feels renewed. He feels most at home there. His body and spirit are unified by his religion. In the mosque he is more loyal to Islam than to his country. Two missionaries discuss God and how he does not exclude any creature from his house. This conversion is ironic against the backdrop of the colonized India. And then in chapter 5, Mrs. Moore is a religious woman. She talks to Roni about the bad and unchristian treatment of the British towards the Indians. She says that God loves everyone and since India is part of the earth, God loves the Indians. In chapter 7, religions, religious thought is divided in India. Aziz blames an Indian couple's bad manners on the fact that they are Hindus. Chapter 13 uh, shows that to put Aziz at ease when Fielding and God Bole do not arrive. This is the kind of attitude that has been narrated by the, the writer that she tells him that they will all be Muslims together signifying their equality. And you will find in chapter 14 Aziz telling Mrs. Moore and Adela that he cannot accept the Hindu notion of universality. He believes it is best if everyone adheres to his own religion. And then in the caves, the, the boom sound raises all religious thoughts from Moore's mind. The echo becomes more powerful than her religious thoughts. And in chapter 22, in the aftermath of, of the incident at the caves, Moore loses her interest in religion in all other aspects of life. And in the final chapters you will find that in her despair Adela strays from her usually intellectual ways and begins praying again. In her absence the Indians at the trial begin to chant Mrs. Moore's name. By mispronouncing her name as Asmus Asmoor they have called her the name of a Hindu goddess. In chapter 33, Mrs. Moore appears in God Bole's head during a spiritual fervor. The visit by Mrs. Moore completes him and brings him closer to God, telling and showing and, and, and expressing as God is love. And now in these chapters you would also find um, an idea regarding East versus West or West versus East. In chapter 2 you will find English people are civil, are projected as civil or even friendly towards natives when they are, when they first arrive in India. However, the longer they stay in India, the greater the gulf grows between them and the Indians. Though the English and Indians are both physically in the East, there is a clear separation between Eastern 
and Western culture in colonized India. In chapter 3 you will find Adela, Adela confronts Roni about his treatment of Indians. Still fresh in India, she feels the bridge between East and West can be crossed with pleasant and equal behavior. Roni advises her that her, na her naive perspective will change the longer she stays in the country. And in chapter 4 you will find that many Indians are skeptical about the sincerity of Torton's invitation to his bridge party. Nawab Bahadur, a person who is respected by British as well as Indians, convinces his countrymen to attend the party. And in chapter 5 you will find that Adela and Mrs. Moore are sad that there is no interaction between the British host and the Indian guests. The bridge party does not create a bridge between the people. And in chapter 7, you will see that feeling and Aziz forge an instant friendship despite their racial differences. And Aziz tells Nawab Bahadur's grandson in chapter 8 that believing in superstition and evil spirits is a defect of the East. The West has advanced. He believes because they believe in reason and logic. However, how do we understand the celebrations of Halloween is still a question. In chapter 16, we will find that Fielding tries to tell Aziz that he should not think about the picnic in terms of East and West, but simply in terms of friendships and relations. In chapter 17, this, gives, uh, this is little heightened when we see that Tartan, who believes his years of experience in India have made him wise and knowledgeable, says that Indians and English are incapable of interacting on an intimate basis. That is why he feels there should exist a great distance between them. And we get to know that Aziz tries to explain this in chapter 27 to feeling that Mrs. Moore, though, though an old British woman, was an Oriental at heart, she had an Eastern way of rela relating to people. Aziz considers measuring emotions, as Fielding does, to be a Western trait. And finally in chapter 37, we will know that Aziz and Fielding part ways knowing they will never see each other again. The notion that Indians and British can never be intimate friends while the British control India seems to hold true. And then the theme of the category of ideas regarding women. In chapter 2 you will find Mrs. Moore impresses Aziz by removing her shoes before she enters the mosque. This is a sign of respect that he does not expect from British women in his country and that astonishes him. Feeling contends that English women can never be friends with Indian men. In chapter 7 um, he talks about this disaster happens whenever the two meet. Well and in chapter 11 you will find that Aziz shows Feeling a picture of his wife and act that is forbidden unless it is between brothers due to the tradition of purda, the separation and veiling of women. Well, Fielding asks if people in the world were to treat each other as equally as brothers, if there would be no more need for purda. In chapter 13, Aziz's friends now warn him that it is not advisable for him to mix with British women. They predict something bad will happen due to his interaction with these British ladies. And finally we get to know that at the club, the men talk of protecting the women and children. This incites the, in them a building national pride. And finally Aziz begins to write poetry about oriental womenhood. He calls for the end of Purda, which he believes is an essential step to forming Indian statehood. So, um, in today's talk, what we did, we got our, ourselves familiar with the with the uh, with the writer a bit, and uh, about the way he's he has written uh, different 
narratives and particularly his narrative um, a passage to India and while discussing some um, highlights of the of the novel we got to know uh, three major divisions of the of the plot that includes um, uh, mosque, caves and temples and later on we have been able to discuss some important uh, references from the text regarding the themes and the categories of ideas of earth, love, nationalism, religion, west versus east and women. So I will see you in the next lecture now with, the, with this hope that by the next lecture you'll be done with your reading and we will be able to discuss everything in detail and you'll be able to follow me. This was all for today's talk. I'll see you in the next lecture now. Allah Hafiz.